The African Union is celebrating its 50th anniversary, but after half a century, is the institution still relevant? The AU has promoted solidarity and economic cooperation across the continent, but has it really served the people of Africa? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to Inside Story. I'm Stephen Cole. The African Union turns 50 this weekend, but while African leaders meet in Addis Ababa to celebrate their achievements and also try to work out a way forward, it's a good time to take stock of this organisation. How successful has it been in promoting pan-African unity? And what is its mandate? Has it moved from fostering economic cooperation and integration to conflict resolution? And how successful has it been at both? Peter Grester has this report from Nairobi. It happens every year. Heads of state from across the continent arrive in Addis Ababa to further the aims of the African Union. Political and economic unity, regional peace and prosperity, respect for democracy. And every year it opens with leaders like Omar al-Bashir who came to power in a military coup and is wanted by the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. Its supporters say the AU has helped draw the continent together. Its critics say it's a club of leaders more interested in protecting each other than dealing with problems. If we can be able to put machinery in place where we can address the issue of impunity at all levels, I think Africa will be able to move forward. The only unfortunate thing which I, I, I recognize is that the people who you want to put machinery in place to address impunity are the same perpetrators. Of all the AU's headaches, the festering conflict in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo is perhaps its biggest. Rwanda is accused of sponsoring rebels. Uganda, Burundi and South Africa are all involved in one form or another. The AU has tried to ease tensions here, but it's never been able to resolve them. It's the UN that has had to do the heavy lifting with the world's biggest peacekeeping force. And elections in places like Zimbabwe undermine the AU's commitment to democracy. The vote back in 2008 was widely criticised as deeply flawed, with the government accused of violent crackdowns on opposition figures. And yet Zimbabwe's president, Robert Mugabe, is another regular at the AU summits. Respect for the principles of human rights, of democracy and the rule of law are deeply embedded in the African Union's own charter. So amidst all of the celebrations, human rights groups across the continent would argue that over the past half century, the AU has fallen well short of its own founding ideals. Peter Grester, Al Jazeera, Nairobi. Well, joining us are our guests in Durban, Shadrach Guto, Professor of African Renaissance Studies at the University of South Africa. In Edinburgh, Adama Gay, he's a China-Africa author and a consultant on Africa Progress panel led by Kofi Annan. And in London, Alex Vines, head of the Africa program at Chatham House. Let's open with Alex Vines. Alex, 50 years of African unity, um, formerly known as the OAU, now celebrating its golden anniversary. Does it have anything to celebrate apart from perhaps still being together? No, I think it's an important moment to celebrate. The African Union that's uh, uh, the newest version of this uh, celebrates has last year 10 years and indeed it's the 50th anniversary. Many things have changed. Most of Africa is decolonized. That's an important uh, uh, celebration. Uh, and you have impressive growth rates in Africa, 7 8%. There are many less wars and conflicts. So Africa uh, has much to celebrate this Sunday in terms of the, 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 the African Union, the, the vision and the renaissance that, 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 that it's based on. Because at the end of the day, this is a celebration of the pan-African vision that goes back into the last century. So it's a good thing. Shadrach Guto. Has the African Union, do you think, showed enough leadership on African issues? Well, I think before one can talk about the African Union, it is important to look at the milestones that were achieved during the uh, OAU, which ended in 2002 when the African Union took over. 
the OAU, one of the primary tasks was to bring solidarity among independent African countries to help those countries that were still under colonial rule to be able to gain their independence using any other means. I think, as you already has been mentioned by Alex, uh, South Africa got its independence in 1994. Uh, the latest and the youngest on the block is, of course, Republic of South uh, Sudan. But by and large, we are dealing with 55 sovereign states on the continent. When the OAU was formed, there were just about 29. So that is an achievement. But of course, the AU taking over from 2002 also began to chart new value systems and ways of governance that were uh, escalating what was there and transforming some of them which were under the OAU. So I believe that the AU is beginning to have its roots on the ground and uh, we expect a lot from it. Uh, let's, let's go to Adama Gay. Uh, uh, Adama, does the African Union, you think, set a, a truly African agenda or are it, it, its critics correct in saying it's too reactive? I would like, uh, first of all, to second what the uh, previous speakers said about the achievements made by Africa uh, in terms of uh, political integration, in terms of uh, uh, creating a mindset of a yearning for African unity, which is there because the organization of the African unity was created in 1963 and it had an agenda to end colonial rule in Africa and to ensure that apartheid was defeated and also ultimately All right. All to right, reduce Adama. the debt of Africa. OK, Adama, well, let's change the question in that case. If you're not going to answer my question, we'll follow on from the previous question. If the two big achievements are the end of colonialism and perhaps the end of apartheid in South Africa, what was the essential role the AU played in these milestone achievements? Because they certainly weren't oh, achieved it, it, just by the AU. Or, uh, the African resolve in challenging apartheid rule was effective in ensuring that there was an embargo against the white colonial rule. Now, the question you ask about is Africa control, controlling its agenda? It's still a relevant and a very pertinent question at this very moment. Because what we see these days, as Africa is becoming very attractive, you have outside forces, external actors, whether you call them the World Bank, extractive industries, organizations like Resource Charter, or the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, Transparency International, and so on and so forth. The, more, many institutions, the United Nations, they are now taking the driving seat and driving the agenda of Africa. Whereas in the past, when you had powerful African leaders who fought for independence, it was a bit different. The African agenda was set, despite the Cold War era, by the Africans. This is now becoming a little bit problematic because Africa is now following uh, those outside organizations to accept that the World Bank position itself like the middle buffer institutions to ensure that finances go through uh, uh, the World Bank, that uh, transparency is on African resources done through those outside organizations, and the United Nations has imposed its agenda of the Millennium Development Goal on African countries. I believe that this time of uh, celebrating 50 years of African unity should be a sober moment, not to be uh, uh, championing what has been achieved, but looking ahead and ensuring that well, that's indeed what they're, that's, this that's time they're going to be Africa about. takes the reign of its leadership. That's what they're going to be talking about, including two of the main issues, a tax and transparency. We will come on to that in a moment. I want to go to Alex Vines, because I, uh, Alex, um, a club of leaders more eager to support each other than they are to lead Africans. How much truth is there in that? Look, we're talking about 55 countries. That's, you know, there, there are more countries in, in Africa in, on the continent than anywhere else in the world. So what I would argue is there's tremendous variability. There, there are, of course, uh, blocks uh, of, of interest represented, but there is a lot of differences of opinion. So you can have, you know, countries that are truly uh, middle income with a very progressive agenda to, to those that are very reactionary that have heads of state that have been in place for 33 years. 
Uh, what I do think is important is that more presidents in Africa are elected regularly. So there are more elections every year in Africa than ever before. That's already a, a, a process. And I think the African Union needs to be applauded as well as its regional economic communities of uh, not accepting non-constitutional changes. Coups in Africa are not accepted in a way that they were uh, a decade ago. That's a real, that's real progress and that shows how the continent is changing. Uh, Shadrach, uh, real, real progress according to Alex from Chatham House, but is it, is it a transparent organisation? It seems one of the recurring criticisms that, are, that I've heard over the years is that most Africans don't really have a clue what's happening at the uh, African Union. Well, if um, m most Africans don't, then the problem is not just with the leaders, but the problem is with all of us. I'm a scholar um, and uh, an academic, and our work is also to be able to do research, to disseminate knowledge, and so on. It is not just the political leaders. So it is a shared responsibility. But I believe that at this stage, if you ask any African, what is African Renaissance, they will tell you something about it. That is the renewal of Africa, so that we reposition Africa where it used to be before uh, slavery and colonialism, because Africa used to have great civilizations. But to do so within a 21st century context, that, that is important. They know, for example, many Africans that uh, who first intervened in places like crisis situations like in Darfur in Sudan. It was the Africa Union forces and then the UN joined them who moved into Somalia with the crisis that is going on there. It was the Africa Union uh, joined by Kenya and then the UN moved in. How did Africa deal with the crisis in the DRC? in Burundi and so on. So if you look at the peace um, and security issues, I think that we can say these are transparent. Of course, there are others which are not transparent. For example, the agreements that many of our countries make with the so-called foreign investors, which are not made transparent and sometimes do exploit the continent more than developing it. These are areas where there's lack of transparency. Of course, corruption uh, is also quite end endemic in many African countries, and we need to combat them. And we have an African treaty dealing with that. The question is how to translate that into practice rather than leave it just as law on paper rather than in practice. Uh, Adama, would you, would you second those sentiments from Shadrach? I think overall I agree with what uh, he just said. But I would uh, qualify them a little bit because uh, these uh, days it's not only the African Union taking the lead. Because we have seen in other circumstances a more uh, problematic trend that has d developed. For instance, in Cote d'Ivoire, it was French forces that intervened using the United Nations umbrella to oust the, uh, of course, uh, uh, the stubborn uh, then president of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Laurent Gbagbo, in Libya. And I'm surprised that, for instance, the African Union is not mentioning anything about uh, the late Muammar Gaddafi, who, who is really who was uh, instrumental in making sure that the African Union and this revival of African Union was, was generated. In Libya, it was foreign forces. You saw Mr. Uh, Cameron and Mr. Sarkozy, then president of France, going to Benghazi and celebrating like during the during 19... Uh, 88, 1998, 1898, sorry, when uh, uh, at Fashoda, uh, the French and uh, uh, British forces came together and agreed somehow in the way Africa should be divided. I think that we are facing a situation whereby outside forces are looming large over this continent that has it's, it's, more attractiveness at this very moment. Indeed, uh, many countries interested in Africa because of its wealth. A new report says Africa, though, is failing to benefit from that huge mineral wealth. A report by the Africa Progress Panel, which is chaired by Kofi Annan, says Africa has been riding a wave of rising commodity prices. With surging Chinese demand for minerals, export prices have been driven to new highs. That should be good news for African countries, but the report says that many Africans are still as poor as they ever were.
despite their country's new riches. The reason? Rising inequality. Well-managed resource wealth could lift millions of Africans out of poverty, but that isn't happening. And the report identifies two reasons why. First, many foreign companies in Africa aren't paying the taxes they should be. Africa loses twice as much in illicit financial outflows as it receives in international aid. That's an amazing statistic. And secondly, African countries still export unprocessed raw materials. Governments and foreign companies should develop ways of processing raw materials before export so that local people can uh, benefit. Uh, Alex Vines, a, a decade of highly effective economic growth hasn't brought comparable benefits uh, in health, nutrition and education. How much of that is laid at the door of the African Union? I think it's still, on this particular issue, it's difficult to blame the African Union, really. Uh, it, it's much more uh, about how individual governments manage their natural resource endowments. I mean, take a country like Equatorial Guinea. It should be one of the richest countries in the world. You know, half a million people live there. Should be as rich as Kuwait, but it isn't. If you look at the human development indices for, the, for that particular country. And that, in the end, is about good governance and uh, proper management of the natural resource endowments. It, but isn't that what the it, African you know, Union is for, example. especially setting up the economic zones, the free trade zones? It, it's exactly set well, up to bring it, wealth to Africans, isn't it? Well, at the end of the day, the African Union is only as strong as its parts. And, at the, and what we are ah. seeing at the moment in this commodity boom is that uh, African countries have tremendous agency. I think I disagree with Adama uh, uh, Gay to, to, to the extent that the agency, the power of African states at the moment, if they have natural resource windfalls, is stronger than it has been for a very long time. I mean, look, Chad, President Debbie, booted out the UN despite pressures from the United States and France. Uh, who would have imagined that? But it gives this agency at the moment, which, again, uh, the point is that this is Africa's moment if African it, leaders is it, is it, is it, choose it, and it, make their wise it, it, decisions. Exactly. Africa's moment. Shadrach, uh, Africa is part of a globalised world. Adama is uh, uh, shaking his head. I'll come back to you, Adama, after I've talked to Shadrach. Um, Africa is part of this globalised world. Is it missing its opportunity? China is right across Africa, taking as many minerals as they can possibly get. How much of African resources are being uh, taken away by other countries? Well, Africa is changing and the world is changing. Of course, the world wouldn't have talked of China being the second largest economy in the world 10 years ago. Today it is. So China has borrowed from the rules of the imperialists and has competed successfully with those imperialists in plundering some of us Africa's resources, but in some areas really breaking out areas of development which are required by Africa. So it is a plus and a minus. The question is how do we negotiate investment? To talk of foreign direct investment, these are the people who actually maintain neo-colonial control of Africa, and China just joined them. And I think that those are the areas we need to look at very, very critically. I indeed. But uh Adam is also right that in situations like Libya, Africa or the AU, yeah, just sat by and saw NATO moving in to try and have a regime that would allow them to go back and get Libya's oil. Okay. We saw the same thing in Ivory Coast. Indeed. But by Indeed. and well, large, uh, as I mentioned before, Africa Union is beginning to set the agenda. Well, maybe, maybe they're beginning to set uh, the agenda too late. Uh, Adama, in several African countries, revenues from natural resources are seen very much as widening the gap between uh, rich and poor. Does that show that uh, Africa's policy makers, not just the presidents, but the uh, AU itself, is missing the boat? Absolutely. Uh, I happen to have uh, been one of the few experts invited by the Africa Progress Panel that uh, includes people like Kofi Annan, uh, Robert Robin, uh, former president of Botswana, Festus Mohai, so on and so forth, uh, when they met uh, to discuss this, uh, to prepare this report. And uh, one of the things I am strongly confident about is that uh, you have a, a failure of leadership in this situation 
from African leaders. They are allowing outside forces to take advantage of the resources and they are, there is no trickling down of the resources into the African societies. There is a problem somehow with uh, my friend Alex Wine. Uh, that uh, the, the report that Africa's moment is there is mainly something that you hear from Western outside forces. If you go within African societies, from Nigeria to Senegal, you ask ordinary people, they will tell you they are not seeing it at the moment. Additionally, a few years ago, in the 70s, for instance, uh, then uh, head of the Organization of African Union, the Cameroonian Zo Ekongaki, when you entered somehow in a shady deal with uh, the, uh, the firm Lonro, he was sacked from office. These days, the kind of leaders you see in Africa are those who are dealing with outside companies and ensuring that as long as they can get their cut, it can continue this way. Okay. And they are facilitating indeed the subtle right. recolonization of this continent. Uh, this word may be heavy, but this is somehow what is happening. All right, well, you know colonial making, colonialism to, making to a comeback. Okay, we, we've, had, we've had some comments already to what we've had to say on Facebook. Uh, Kalutawa Aquiles argues, I don't see the relevance of the African Union any longer. Africans are still not united to press for a common goal of economic independence. Can Africans take a moment and try to imagine how we'll be living if the Europeans didn't come here in the first place? Sometimes I think I'm forced to think there's something intrinsic in us, Africans, that repels development. Christopher Alvin Makayas says, look at the ever-present conflicts in every part of Africa. The AU has failed to foster peace and end impunity. It's a club of rich presidential warlords. Well, that's quite some criticism. Um, in the time we have, Lester, uh, Alex, I want to talk to you about conflict resolution. Has that been a successful part of African unity work? Well, look, the, the conflict resolution has a long history in terms of the OAU, the Organization for African Unity, uh, was involved in mediation. Often it hasn't been reported or written about. Uh, the same with the African Union. And there are some successes, but there are some, some setbacks and failures. A good example, I think, of where the African peace and security architecture vision uh, is it has still to be developed is recent events in in, in Mali. The, the, it required a French intervention in the end in January to deal with what was an existential threat both to Africa but also to the West. So there, there, there are examples of limits but on the other hand if you look at how successful the African Union forces have been in helping the, Suda, the, the, sorry, the Somali government, so the Amazon forces, that is a very good example of how African forces themselves have been able to do better the, 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 than their Western counterparts. Okay. So th it's a mixed checklist. Mix, indeed, mixed indeed. Shadrach, um, the AU, uh, the OAU had a dream of pan-Africanism. Is, just, just, is that academic or is that going to be proved to be a realistic dream? No, uh, Pan-Africanism is the vision, mission and determination that led to the liberation of Africa from colonial rule. We are escalating that. This year's theme um, is really Pan-Africanism, an African renaissance. What is added is African renaissance to boost the Pan-Africanism so that we take it to a higher level where we can go now too much to, uh, a lot toward uh, regional, relative political integration, um, economic integration, development infrastructure to ensure that the trade within Africa escalates from about something like 11% within intra-African trade to something in the 30s, 50s, in the next maybe 10, 15 years like other regions. These are visions which are there. The question are, do we have drivers? Okay. We have the uh, vehicles, we have uh, the fuel, we have everything, but I think we are lacking real drivers and that is where we all need to reflect. Well, maybe at that point we, we uh, move on from this discussion. Uh, thanks to all my guests in Durban, Shadrach Guto in Edinburgh, Adama Gay uh, in London, Alex Vines. And thank you all very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us more feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. I'm Stephen Cole. Goodbye for now.